Good morning, everybody. It's Jeff Goldberg for the Sales Pro Network. It is, let's take a look, Friday, September 10th. I should have known that. It's the day before September 11th. Should have had that in my brain. And it's a beautiful Friday here on Long Island. It is 10 a.m. And as many of you know, I founded the Sales Pro Network because I'm a sales coach and trainer. I work with both individuals and organizations to help them increase their sales. And I founded this group for people who want to do exactly that increase your sales, make more money, and to elevate the profession itself. The Sales Pro Network is a place where you can come in, ask questions, get coaching, share your successes, your challenges, anything at all sales or sales management related, this is the place for you. And today, in, uh, what I normally do on Fridays is either do an interview or a training session. Today, we're going to be doing a session of what I call Ask Jeff. I asked you guys what you wanted to know, and some of you actually put some questions in. If you are here watching live, please put in a comment, say, hey, it's me. And if you did not connect your Facebook to StreamYard, please be sure to put your name in there. Otherwise, all I'm going to see is Facebook user. Um, I do have about five or six questions from the group, so I'll answer those. If you have any questions as I'm speaking, please toss them into the comments, and I'll do my best to answer those too. Some of these questions have some fairly short answers, so I don't know that this will be an hour together, but uh, I'll do my very best. And the first question uh, we're going to cover is from... Our friend from Westbury, who sometimes logs in a little late, I don't know if he's on yet, our executive recruiter, Don Levine. Don wanted to know about companies that supply leads or that promise to supply leads. Ah, good morning, Ben Gibbs. He says, hey, it's me. Good to see you. And you've actually connected your Facebook. Oh, you're on LinkedIn. Good job. Yes, we're, we're streaming live to LinkedIn and to Facebook and to YouTube. For those of you who aren't aware, who are members of the Sales Pro Network, we have a YouTube channel called the Sales Pro Network where you can also catch these lives and all the recordings are there too. So Don Levine wanted to know about companies that promise to supply leads. Here's my take on companies that promise to supply leads. Make them prove it. I've invested tens of thousands of dollars with various companies that promise to either send me leads or actually give me appointments and I've yet to find one that pays off. Not a single one. Um, now, there's a difference between a company that promises to supply you leads and a company that sells you a database with information that you can then mine, like Seamless AI, like Zoom Info, like Hoover's, like the A to Z data. There's millions and millions of them. I'll just share with you my personal experience. At best, most of them are 60% accurate, at best. But 60% accurate is better than 0% accurate, which means you've got a place where you can go and look up information. It may not be the most up-to-date information. Maybe a phone number is wrong. Maybe contact information for particular people is incorrect, or maybe they aren't there anymore, but at least it's something to use. When you're trying to use a database to search, do research, then I suggest just about all of them are fairly equal unless you're reeling to, really willing to invest some serious money. The one that has been shown to me a couple of times and that people rave about, everybody who uses this one says it's really, really the most accurate one. It's called Zoom Info, Z-O-O-M Info. Uh, that's not the same as the company that does video conferencing Zoom. This is called Zoom Info. Uh, I have had clients who've used it who swear by it. I recently had conversations with a guy who uh, was looking into it, who has a friend who uses it and gets all kinds of great information out of it. So, Don... If the company is going to, if you're just using a database to do research, Zoom Info seems to be a great one. A lot of people speak really highly about uh, Seamless.ai also. The rest, I've tried a lot of them. Again, 60, 65% accuracy, but that's better than nothing. Personally, I use the A to Z database because my library offers it for free. I think it's about eleven dollars or $12,000 a year if you pay for it yourself. So that's a substantial savings. And again, it's just, I'm just looking to have it point me in the right direction. However, uh, if you're looking to work with a company that actually promises to supply you leads, my coaching would be ask them to prove it and ask them to prove it by doing at least a few for free. What I would really want is a company that will do it not just for free, but will do it on a pay per success basis, a pay for success basis. So I'm having a conversation at one o'clock this afternoon with somebody who's promised that. I'm willing to talk to this guy, even though I've spoken to many, many people like that, because I know him. Uh, when I say he's a friend, he's not a friend who I hang out with, but he's a guy I certainly have spoken with more than once, uh, both online and on the phone. So I'm going to talk to him because he said, Jeff, I'm willing to supply you with appointments, uh, with, with, with leads for people who are interested in speaking with you. And all I'm asking is a percentage of the deal when you close it. 
That's the thing I would be looking for, Don. If you can find a company that feels so strongly that they will bring you success, that they will successfully be able to give you qualified leads, then that's a company I'd be worth that would be worth paying. And if they're so confident, then they should be willing to at least work on a pay for success basis, at least in the beginning. Give me 30 days, give me 60 days where you'll take money only if you give me success. But if not, I'm very, very concerned. Uh, I think everybody's been burned by these kind of people, Don, so I'd be very, very cautious. Good morning, Steve Kent. Good to see you, sir. Always. Next, our uh, uh, Larry Weiss, the telephone guy, asked, how do you get or keep clients who are only looking at price? Wow, do I love this question. So clients who are only looking at price. So first, I want to share this with you, Larry. I don't talk to clients who are only looking for price because I don't believe anybody is truly only looking for price. When somebody's looking for the kind of services that I provide, I do sales training, I do sales coaching, I do sales consulting, and I do outsource sales management. But let's just talk about training or coaching. Let's just talk about coaching for a second. When somebody feels that they're good at sales, but they want to get better, or maybe they're not so good and they want to get better, or they're pretty good and they want to make more money. I often work with people who are making fairly substantial amounts of money, $100,000, $150,000 a year, but they want to go to the next level. And I also work with people who are making $60,000, $70,000 a year, and they want to take it to the next level. Well, I don't think any of them, not a single one of them, was looking for the cheapest sales coach they could find the least expensive sales coach that they could find. In fact, I know for a fact what they were looking for is the best sales coach they could possibly get at a number that they feel was reasonable and that they could actually afford. So I'm just going to make up a number here. Let's say I charge $5,000 an hour for coaching. And of course, I charge way more than that. No, I'm just kidding. But let's say I charge $5,000 an hour for coaching. Well, if I can show you $5,000 uh, worth of value, then it's worth it to you. And if I can't, then obviously it's not. But if somebody's, if I charge $5,000 an hour and somebody says, I was really looking for $500 an hour, well, first of all, they're making a huge mistake because you're probably not going to find somebody who's worth their salt if the average person who does this charges five grand and somebody else charges 500. Um, and, and the thing to keep in mind, Larry, is we as salespeople tend to believe that it is about the price. The prospect often tends to believe it's about the price until they find out that it's not. For example, I know that one of the things you sell, Larry, I'm talking to you, is phone service. I'm going to start selling Jeff's phone service and I can do it for a tenth of the price that you do it. I don't even know what you charge, but I'll do it for a tenth. I'll do it for a twentieth. Am I going to sign up customers? I probably will get some will say, wow, 20 times less. I'd rather spend 20 times less money than what I'm spending now until they find out that when they use Jeff's phone service, only one in eight calls connects and that call drops 50% of the time. And if they have a problem, customer service is nowhere to be found. And if they're really looking for good advice, I'm not your guy, which I know you are, Larry. I know you are the guy who's going to be there when they call. I know you do have good advice. I know you to be a human being who would, will not sell them something they don't need, don't want, or that they can't use. So when a client thinks they want a better price, look, uh, don't get me wrong. We all want the best price we can possibly get, but I don't want it at the expense of great service and, and great products. So what our job is, to answer your question, Larry, how do you get or how do you keep clients who are only looking at price? First of all, you weed them out very quickly, very, very quickly. Tell people, look, if you're looking for the cheapest price, I'm not your person. I'm not your guy. I'm not your gal. I don't do the cheapest price. What I do is the best service. I give the greatest consulting. I give the best advice. And when, when you decide to do business with me, you can rest assured you're going to be well taken care of. Your phone system is going to work. I'm going to do everything to make sure that it's, it's up and running before you even know there might have been a problem. And when there is an issue, God forbid, but if there ever is, I'm on it like flies on poop. My belief is that people who think they're looking for the best possible price are misguided. And when they see the light, then they can often maybe not always, but often be convinced to invest more heavily. It's like the example I use all the time, Larry, is um, 
I don't know what kind of car you drive, but I'm going to take a wild guess that it's probably not a 1975 Honda Accord. And my question would be for you, if that's not the case, if you do not drive a 1975 Honda Accord, I know I don't, but the question is, why not? And the question, why not, is because you can pick one up for about 250 bucks, maybe 300 bucks. A 1975 Honda Accord, 200, 300, maybe 500 bucks. They run forever. They're comfortable. They may not be sexy, but they're great cars. Well, the reason that most of us don't drive a $250 or $300 1975 Honda Accord is because we see the value, the value in owning a newer car. I'm driving a 2021. The last one was a 2018. I like a new car. I like the feel of it. I like the smell of it. I like having up-to-date features. Uh, I, I want a car that makes me feel good when I get into it. And I actually owned a Honda Accord, I think about 10 years ago. Great car. Didn't feel great every time I got into it, though. I'm willing to pay more because I want what I want. And each of us wants what we want. And that's what we have to remind our clients, we, that I'm able to give you what you want. And the only way we can do that is by asking a bunch of questions. Now, Larry, for you in particular, this is not an accusation because I know you. And for any of you that are watching, I'm certainly not accusing you. But if you guys are doing what the typical salesperson does, which is pitch, we tell people, here's why we're the greatest company in the world, and here's why you should be using us. They're not seeing the value because we're not having a conversation with them. We're not finding out what their challenges are with their current provider, what they'd really like to accomplish. See, that's the key to selling, my friends. It's not about your sales pitch, I promise. I know how to pitch. I'm a professional presenter. I sometimes stand in front of large audiences, whether online or in person, and share information. I know how to present. It's not what closes business for me. And it's certainly not my pricing that closes business for me. It's also not about my strong closing skills, although I know how to close strong. Many of you know I sold Encyclopedia Britannica door to door for eight years. I know how to close people, but that's not what closes business for me anymore. What closes business for me are three things. One, I'm a really good question asker. I'm able to ask good questions and engage in excellent conversations with my prospect, which end up with them choosing to do business with me because I've had a great conversation with them and they see the, the value in doing business with me. I'm really good at asking them questions about what they're doing now regarding what I have to offer them. What are they doing now to increase sales? What are they doing now to get more appointments with decision makers, to shorten their sales cycle, to close more business more profitably? Because when I know that, Larry, when I know what they're doing now, I'm able to show them how I can help them do it better. And that's where they're going to see the value. So I'm good at engaging them in conversations and being truly interested in them. The second thing that makes me good at selling and how I close business and make it not about the price is I'm a really good listener. I wasn't always. I've worked hard to become a good listener. I had to turn off, uh, well, I had to lower the ego, which said it's all about me and my great pitch. It's not. I had to lower my ego and realize that I, what I really need to do is listen to my prospect because here's what I believe, my friends. If you ask the right questions and you listen actively, and most of us suck at listening, but if you really listen actively, your prospect, just like my prospects, will tell you everything you need to know in order to help them choose to do business with you. And when they see the value, it becomes less about price and more about, I got to have some of that. I got to have some of what Larry's offering. Because I need a guy who actually understands phones and how I communicate with my clients and my prospects and what I need and how he's going to keep me up and running and all that stuff. We have to be really good at communicating those things. So we're going to ask great questions and listen actively to the answers. And the third thing that really makes me good at selling, which can make any of you good at selling, is telling great stories. We as human beings communicate through stories. We just do. It's just the way it is. If you'd like to be a bottom line person like I'd like to be, I want no story, except my own. I love telling stories. I don't want to listen to yours, though, unless they're really, really interesting. But as salespeople, we need to tell stories because as human beings, that's who we are. We tell stories. Ever have, If you have a wife or a husband or a boyfriend or a girlfriend or kids, do any of them ever get to the bottom line? No, everything's a story, everything. And often they're long, boring stories. I saw a meme just the other day. It showed a guy who had a young face. At, actually, it might have been um, Tom Hanks. Maybe it was Tom Hanks as a young guy. And then Tom Hanks from Shipwreck, where he's got the long beard. And the first one said, uh, 
Here's how I look when my kid starts telling me a story. Here's how I look by the time they finished. Kids always tell long stories. I, 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 I did stand-up comedy for the first time in 28 years uh, a week ago. I'm doing it again in two weeks for anybody who's on Long Island, by the way. I'll be at the Governor's Comedy Club in Levittown on the January 20, uh, on uh, September 23rd, not January 23rd. But um, everything's a story. I'm telling stories up there. As a human race, we communicate through stories. So that's what we have to do. We have to tell verbal proof stories, Larry, about somebody else like them, who by using us, even though we weren't the least expensive option, lived happily ever after. And by the way, that's something I tell prospects right up front. In the very beginning of a sales call, I tell people I'm not cheap. I do that in my brief commercial when I'm chatting with them. So first, I'm going to establish some rapport with them and get them talking about themselves. And then I'm going to give them my brief commercial, which ends every single time with this. By the way, even though we're not the least expensive option, people choose Jeff Goldberg and Associates because when we leave, their salespeople get more appointments with decision makers, shorten their sales cycle, and they just plain close more business, more profitable. So I'm telling people right up front, that's in the first probably 15 minutes of, a, of the first sales call. I'm telling you right up front, I'm not cheap. I'm certainly not the cheapest. And I know I'm not. I'm not the cheapest. I'm not the most expensive either. I know my pricing is kind of right about in the middle for both coaches and trainers. There's some who are way more expensive, some who are less expensive. In my opinion, very few is good, but I charge what I charge for a reason. And if anybody doesn't see that value, I put it on me, not them, Larry. It's up to me to make sure I'm having great conversations and communicating with them in a way that they go, ah, I see it. I know I could spend less, but it's worth more and I'm going to pay it. People want things that are right for them. Perfect example. And then I'm going to move on to the next question. I got invited to a cocktail party uh, at a country club. Two years ago, I think it was. I just got an invitation for the uh, the same uh, party this year. And I'm very excited because I don't go to country clubs often. I'm not a country club kind of guy. I actually had to call the host and ask her, um, what does one wear to a cocktail party at a country club? Because I don't go to those. And she goes, oh, you know, you want to dress casually, you know, sport jacket. And I said, I don't own any sport jackets. I have suits and I have jeans. That's it. She goes, well, you might want to wear a sport jacket. So being the kind of guy I am, I went to Bloomingdale's and I started trying on sports jackets. Tried on a bunch of them, wasn't happy. But one of them, the guy, the, the guy who was helping me put one of them on me. And it was, it was as if, oh, the guy's name who uh, designed it just threw out of my head. John Barbados. It was as if John Barbados had me in mind when he designed this sports jacket. It's like, it fit me perfectly. It, it felt good. Uh, when I looked at the price tag, I was like, Holy guacamole. <laughs> That's more than I've paid for many of my suits, but I had to have it. You know why? Because it was perfect for me. I saw the value and that's what we have to do, Larry. I believe if you can show people enough value that some of them will stick around or come to you, even though you're not the least expensive. Here's one more thought on that before I move on. Constant prospecting, and this is the second time I've had this conversation already today, and it's only 10, 10, 18. Constant prospecting makes a huge difference because if you are not speaking with enough prospects and you start getting beat up on price, you are going to fold. You're going to take the business, even though it's not as profitable as you want it to be, because you need the business too badly. If you want to be a more effective salesperson, if you want to be a more effective negotiator, please consistent, effective prospecting solves 50% of all sales challenges. So that was a very long answer, Larry. I hope that was useful. I'm not sure if you were here for all of it because you came on and said good morning uh, about halfway in, but you can always catch the rest of it on the replay. So let's move on to the next question. Alexander Acker asks, moving into a new vertical you have no experience in. So I'm guessing he's asking for advice on how to move into a new vertical that you have no experience with. So my, my first piece of advice is to not worry about it. Do not worry about accepting a position in a vertical that you have zero experience with or a, a type of company that you have no experience with or a type of product or service. I have gone to company after company when I was an employee where I had zero experience with anything that they had to offer. But what I did have experience with was sales and sales management. I joined a company called Frost & Sullivan many years ago as one of their co-national sales directors. At the time, I had zero experience in market research. And four years later, while I had four years of experience in market research, I still don't know that I was an expert in it, that's for sure. 
What I was really good at was managing, building and managing a sales team. Because when I got there in New York, they had three salespeople. And when I left four years later, I had built it up to 45. I did not need to know about what they sell in order to do my job effectively. Now, here's the other thing. When I started working with them, of course, I made it my business to learn as much as I possibly could. And that's my advice for you, Alexander. I don't know if you like to be called Alexander or Alex, but either way, that's my advice for you. First of all, I'd be reading any books I possibly could on the subject. There's a book written about everything and usually multiple books, certainly tons of them on selling. But even in the vertical that you're in, I'll bet there are a ton of books on that industry. The second thing I would do is I'd use uh, this very cool thing we have where I live. I'm not sure where you live, Alexander, but uh, I live on in uh, Long Beach on Long Island. We have this cool thing called, um, I always forget the name. Um, oh, Google. <laughs> use Google. Start learning as much as you possibly can. Invest in yourself. Invest in your new career. Take the time. And by the way, give yourself the time to learn. And when I say give yourself the time to learn, I mean do it as quickly as you possibly can. But understand that Rome wasn't built in a day. The other thing I'd be doing is I'd be talking to each and every person on the sales team and each and every person in the company that I possibly could. When I was an employee salesperson years ago, anytime I joined a new organization, the first thing I did was I made a lunch date with the top producer so I could pick their brain. It's very easy. Usually top producers have big egos. So if, if Larry Weiss, if you were the top producer in an organization and I just joined it, I go, hey, Larry, man, I heard you're the best salesperson in the group. I was wondering if I could buy your lunch, maybe pick your brain a little. Maybe you've got some advice for a rookie like me. Well, I don't know about you guys, but if somebody said that to me, I'd go, yeah, baby, I got advice for you. I know what I'm talking about and I'll be happy to let you buy me lunch. But they have there's a wealth of information in whatever vertical you're going into in the organization you're going to join. Ask a bunch of people. The other thing you should certainly do is ask your manager, what should I be doing? How can I best learn? How can I get up to speed as quickly as I possibly can? But also, Alexander, make sure that you give yourself a break. I find too many salespeople put undue pressure on themselves. Now, when I say that, I, I do outsource sales management, so I manage salespeople. I put pressure on salespeople, but not crazy pressure. Usually the salesperson puts way more pressure on themselves, especially when they join a new organization. So relax a little bit, realize it's gonna take you time. If your manager doesn't realize that or your boss doesn't realize that, then they shouldn't be in the position they're in. But it's gonna take you a little time. But given that it's going to take you a little time, do everything you possibly can to get up to speed as quickly as possible. Here's one more piece of advice about that. Don't wait per for perfection. Don't wait till you know everything. You don't have to. You can always say to somebody, wow, that's a great question. I'm a little bit new with the company, so I know where to get the answer. So why don't we do this? I'm going to get the answer and get back to you. Or I'm going to get the answer and let's set another appointment. I'll come back and give it to you. Uh, but, but give yourself a break and study as hard as you possibly can. There's a wealth of information out there, Alex. Plenty of information to learn any industry. There's not a single industry that I can think of off the top of my head that I'm not 100% confident that I could go out and sell given enough time to learn about it. I've been in many career, well, not many careers. I've always been in sales and sales management, but I've worked for many different companies selling lots of different products or services. There was only one that I didn't do well in, and that was the timeshare business. And that was because I think I was too honest. <laughs> there, there, there was a lot of pressure involved there in helping somebody take a one hour uh, walk through a, a timeshare and getting them to invest $45,000 an hour later. And it was certainly a one call close because I was unwilling to lie, cheat or steal, which I'm just not willing to do that. I failed miserably. Spent two months in the business and said, this is not for me and moved on. Luckily, I moved on to the sales training business and answered an ad, a blind ad in the New York Times, which turned out to be where I've been for the last uh, two decades. So I hope that was helpful, Alexander. Study hard, give yourself a break ask for help from your manager and speak to people in the organization, especially any top producers. <coughs> excuse me. Deborah, I hope I, <coughs> excuse me again, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Deborah Van Dorn Struning, Strenning, I apologize if I pronounce, one of those is probably correct and I'm not sure which one. Uh, her question was simply prospecting. So my hunch is the question is, what can I do to prospect for new business? Excuse me one second, guys. Okay, so that question could easily take up eight hours. And that's how long I, when I do my professional prospecting seminar, Deborah, it's, it is an eight hour day where I teach all kinds of things. Here's the bottom line of it. 
first of all, you've got to do things that you're, <coughs> excuse me, willing to do. Uh, for example, I cold call once a month for about 20 to 30 minutes just to make sure that the way I'm teaching people to do it is still working. But other than that, I'd rather live in my car than cold call if I have to ever get a, uh, an appointment again. I've worked very hard, though, to develop other ways of prospecting. And I'll tell you this, cold calling, if you do it well, which most people don't, and there's lots of people who can teach you how to do it. I interviewed a guy for us, uh, Jason Bay, young guy, permission-based prospecting, really good. Go look at his website. It's um, blissfulprospecting.com or take a look at the interview that we did with him, I think about a year ago. Uh I, I'm sure he would agree with this statement that says cold calling via the telephone is still the most cost effective and time efficient way to fill up your calendar with appointments if you do it well. If you suck at it, then you're going to waste your time and it's going to make you miserable because there's massive rejection in cold calling. But if you do it well, you can certainly get appointments that way. I'm also a huge fan of networking. Now, when I say networking, I mean joining a networking group or several networking groups if you, if you like to put your uh, eggs in uh, more than one basket and really devoting your time to doing it effectively. I've been in one networking group for the last 16 years. About 50% of my business comes from that group because A, it's a great group. It's a little bit higher level, meaning it's a little more expensive than many, uh, which makes sure that people are pretty serious about giving and getting referrals, as well as all the other great benefits that come from being a member of that group. Um, the key to networking effectively is not just to have a great brief commercial and say it every week or two weeks or once a month, however often your meetings are. Although, of course, you need a great brief commercial so that people understand what you do and can refer you when appropriate. But what really makes networking effective is when you take the time to get to know the people that you're networking with, and they take the time to get to know you. In the group that I belong to, they're called opportunity calls. In many groups, they're called one-on-ones. But if, uh, let's see, Steve Kent is on the line. So if I met Steve Kent for the first time in a networking group, I would say something like this. Hey, Steve, why don't we get together, uh, have breakfast or lunch or dinner or some cocktails or let's do a Zoom call. Just you and me getting to know each other and seeing how we can help each other's business. Um, I keep these meetings, well, if when they were in person, which uh, for, my, for me, mostly they're not these days. Most of the ones I do are via Zoom. But when they were in person, I used to allow an hour. Now I allow either 30 or 45 minutes, depending on the person themselves. And I want to make sure that we do two things. One is I'm always going to start out with, so tell me about yourself and how I can best help you. And what I'm listening for is I want to hear about them as a human. Tell me about your family if you've got one. Tell me about your past, your background, what got you to be who you are. And I certainly want to hear about your business and what ways I might be able to help you. And I always go first because I want to be generous with people. But I know that at some point they're going to say, good, tell me a little bit about you. I am going to tell them about my three kids who I adore and how much I love pugs and that I'm doing stand-up comedy again and that I've been in sales for. I'm going to tell them all about my life and who I am and where I live and all that stuff because the more we get to know people on a personal basis, the more we trust them and the more we like them. And I don't know about you guys, uh, or, or I certainly don't know about you, Deborah, but um, I'm not going to give a referral to anybody who I don't trust implicitly. So for example, Larry Weiss, who I know is on this call, I would recommend him to anybody. I know Larry. I trust that when I, in, uh, uh, not interview Larry, although I'd be happy to interview Larry, what, I know that when I refer Larry, he's going to go in and make me look good. And the way most people network is, look, I'm going to give you a referral. Please don't make me look bad. That's not good enough for me. I know if I refer Larry or Steve Kent or Ben Gifts uh, and, uh, or any of you, uh, well, any of you others, who are watching right now, who I actually know, I know these guys will make me look good. Ben Gibbs, if I refer him to a client, I know I'm going to get a call later on who's going to say, wow, thank you so much for introducing me to Ben. That guy's awesome. You know why? Because Ben is. And that's the only type of people I refer. That's the only type of people I'll network with. But you can only know that, Deborah, if you take the time to really get to know them. I'm not going to give referrals to just anybody. So networking is a great way to develop business if you're willing to put in the time and, and the effort. LinkedIn, we've interviewed lots of LinkedIn experts on this, uh, on, in this Facebook group uh, in our lives, and there's a reason for it. LinkedIn is the salesperson's best friend if you use it effectively, just like anything else. 
if you're just looking to connect with lots and lots of people and be what they call a lion, uh, I don't know what the O stands for, a LinkedIn something networker. Uh, to me, it's over the top networker. It's I think you have to have at least 5,000 connections for, some, for or something like that, or maybe it's over 500, whatever the number is. Here's the thing though. Connections are important, but they're not it. Just because I connect with somebody certainly doesn't mean I'm going to refer them or they're going to refer me. So that's not a great methodology for using LinkedIn effectively. Now, certainly you should connect with people that you feel either you would like to get to know. Well, first of all, you should connect with people online who you already network with because you already like and trust those people. You should also form connections with people that you're willing to get to know if you want to network with, with them because that's what LinkedIn was originally devised for. It was networking online. It's since you know transformed into a recruiting tool, a sales tool, and all kinds of other things. But it was really just networking online, and that was a brilliant idea. But just having lots and lots of connections doesn't do it. I've got about 45 people in the group that I belong to, and that's way huge. That's a huge amount of people. But I know each and every one of them. I've sat down to breakfast, lunch, or dinner, or at least Zoom calls with each and every one of them, and I continue to, even with people who I know for 16 years or more. There's one guy in that, the group that I know since high school. We still connect regularly because there's the thing about we want to be top of mind. Look, of the 44 other people in my networking group, I, they, they should want me to keep them top of mind as much as possible. I certainly don't go on sales calls and have each and every one of them in my mind going, how can I refer Mitch? How can I refer Doug? How can I refer uh, Carol? I don't but I am listening for openings for them. And I hope they're listening for openings for me when they're talking to their prospects and their client. So networking can be highly effective, but just like any everything else, Deborah, it's got to be done well. I'm just taking a quick check of the time. We're doing well. Um, email marketing. Email marketing is another way. It's certainly like cold calling. It's, a, it's throwing a bunch of stuff at the wall and seeing if some, some of it sticks, but if you are doing it effectively, some of it will. Uh, I am not an email marketing expert. I'm not a marketing expert at all. I have other people that I either go to for advice or refer people to for that kind of advice. But here's a couple of things that I can share with you that I've found out about email marketing. First of all, your subject line is everything. It, 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 if your subject line isn't fantastic, you're screwed. Because if I don't open your email, it doesn't matter how great the body of it is, I'm not going to open it. I'm not going to respond to it. You can't possibly close me. You can't possibly get an appointment with me. You can't possibly sell me anything if I don't even open your email. So your subject line better be great. It cannot be ridiculous. Like you may have won a million dollars. That's going to get caught in somebody's spam filter in two seconds. So it can't be that. Here's from studying. This is not something I invented, but I did a lot of studying. This is what I've learned. First of all, if you put somebody's name in the subject line, somebody's specific name, in the subject line, you dramatically increase the odds of them opening your email. Now, what this means is you probably can't send out mass emails because I don't know of any system, and there could be one out there, but I don't know of any system that will allow you to put in you know, the code for a first name in the subject line. So it means you've got to send them one by one. It takes a little more time, but if it increases the open rate dramatically, that's well worth it. The other thing I learned was if you put somebody's name and their location in the subject line, Again, dramatic increase in open rate. So if I send somebody a, a, uh, a subject line that says um, increasing sales, maybe some people will open it because they're interested in increasing sales, but most people are going to say, oh, here comes another come on from a sales trainer. But if I write, hey, Steve, increasing sales, you've got a better ch I've got a better chance of Steve opening it. And if I write, hey, Steve, increasing sales in Nassau County, New York. Better yet, if I, because I happen to know Steve, if I say increasing real estate sales in Nassau County, New York, I've got a pretty good chance of Steve opening that because one, I've used his real name. And two, I know where the guy lives. At least I think he lives in Nassau County. You might be in Suffolk County, Steve, I'm not sure. But I've got a much better chance of him opening it. So the person's subject line and, oh, wait, somebody said good software developers can personalize the emails. Okay, well, I don't know who this is, but one of our, is my mouse not working? There we go. Whoop. There you go. Good software developers can put the personalized email. So I guess there might be a way to do that. I don't know how to do that, but there might be a way. So um, good subject line, mention their name and their location. And then yes, the body of the email has to be good too. Uh, there's a concept in uh, 
advertising called Above the Fold. If you've ever seen a New York Times newspaper, most people on the subway, not that I've been on the subway in uh, ages and I don't intend to go on it anytime soon, but the, the New York Times is a very long newspaper. So most people fold it in half. Well, the top half is called Above the Fold and the bottom half is Below the Fold. In email, Below the Fold would be anything you have to page down for. Or, or move your cursor down for. So what we want to do is we want to keep the main, the most important part of our message above the fold. I may not read your whole message. I don't have time. And you probably don't have the time to read my whole message either. If you're anything like me, I get between 250 and 400 emails every single day. I can't read them all. I just can't. So I've got to get rid of a lot of them. Your subject line, not great. Delete. If I know you, if I recognize your name, if I recognize the sender, I'll absolutely open it up your email. But if I don't recognize your name, your subject line better catch me. And then once I open it, you better grab me right away. You better have some benefit that you can show me very quickly about why I should give you an appointment or why I should respond. So email marketing, Deborah, is another great way to do business. By the way, I'm a big fan of using video in email marketing. Uh, there's a service called Vimeo. I think they have a free option where you can create um, videos and then Im you can just embed them into an email. If you're going to do that, and I certainly think you should, here's a couple of tips. One, keep your message very short. 60 seconds or less is probably all anybody is going to give you. The other thing is personalize it. Uh, I'm going to just grab something right here for a second. Show you guys. Get one of these little whiteboards and have this. So if I was going to send this to send an email to somebody named Dan, I would have this uh, right up front. And why? Because if I have it up front, then when he gets the email, this is exactly what he's going to see. Dan is going to see a message say says, "Hey Dan, how are sales?" Now, if I send, if Steve Kent gets a message like that from, well, Steve knows me, but let's say Steve Kent didn't know me. Um, <laughs> Steve says, "I'm close. He lives in Flushing. That's close to Nassau County. Good enough." Um, if I send Steve a message just like that, he opens an email and he sees there's a video and on the video it says, hey, Steve, how are sales? I'm betting there's a very good chance that Steve is going to open that email because, again, I've used his name. I'm almost positive Vimeo offers a free version. If not, I don't think it's very expensive. You can create your videos yourself, but there's a, it's a great way to catch people's attention. So, Deborah, that was a long-winded answer to tell you that multi-pronged approach, what I call a blended approach to prospecting is what I advise. Here's one more thing about prospecting. Test and measure. Do A-B testing on, on everything you send out. Test your subject line, see what works best. Test the time of day you send out an email, the time you make calls, the things you say. A-B test everything and use what works. I always tell training clients, I don't care if you do anything I teach you. Your boss is paying me for a reason because they think I know something, but all I'm committed to is you getting the result you need, which is more appointments and more closed business. So that's what I would recommend, Deborah. Uh, whatever you are willing to do, like I said, I'm not willing to cold call, but it's got to be what you're willing to do and then what's actually working and that you have the time for. And let's see, Chris Jones. Hey, Chris, good to see you. Great stuff. I would say you know a little bit about email marketing, uh, a very little bit, my friend. Uh, let's get on to the next question. 1038. We're good on time. Uh, <laughs> here's a great one. My friend David Colclang says, Jeff Gribbs gives great email. Uh, David is someone who's a friend of mine and a member of the networking group I'm in. And he knows that uh, I've made the offer to all of the people in the group. If you have an email you're going to send out, feel free to send it to me. I'll take a look at it. I'll either get back to you right away and say, hey, this is exactly what I would say to a prospect or client, or I'll give you my best advice. Uh, I always say it's not bragging if it's true. I happen to be a good writer. I've written two, co-authored two books. I'm good at writing email. So uh, you guys too, the Sales Pro Network, you want to send an email, send me the email first. I'll take a quick look at it. I can't do that for all of you every day, but I'm happy to help you out uh, every now and then. And really, I'm constantly stunned, and this has nothing to do with my friend David, uh, by the not a real word. I was about to say inarticulateness. That was an inarticulate word, but the inability of many people to communicate via email. Uh, just because you can speak doesn't mean you can write well. And I am not a big fan of people who can't communicate via email. Uh, it's, it's important to be able to write a business letter, uh, whether it's being sent via snail mail or email. So if you need some help with that, there are people who can help you with business writing. One of our, uh, members, Dr. Rich Atkins, uh, his company is um, Improving Communications. He offers a business writing course. 
great place to, to, to get some help. Let's move on to the next question from Les Wolf. Les says, his question is getting new clients to invest wisely in your business, getting new leads. I'm guessing those are two questions and the getting new leads. Les, I hope you were listening for the last 10 minutes when I was talking to Deborah. Getting clients to invest wisely in your business. I'm going to take a wild guess here, Les, that you're, what you're really asking me for is how do you close people? Uh, I don't know if Les is looking, is watching right now, but um, if you are, please let me know that that's what you, what you were looking for. How do you get people to buy from you? Uh, Les owns a business where he sells collectibles, baseball cards, pictures, all kinds of things like that. Uh, very nice guy. And he wants people to invest with him. Well, we all want people to invest wisely with us. So here's the key. Learn how to sell. Learn how to prospect effectively so you speak to lots and lots of people and then learn how to sell. Look, I'm a sales coach. I can teach you how to sell. There's lots and lots of people like me who can do that. Read books, go to seminars, go to YouTube. We, You and I, our group right here, we have a channel on YouTube filled with these interviews with lots of great people who've given us excellent advice. Some of them are just me giving out some of my knowledge. And there's a gazillion guys and gals just like me who are giving away information for free, for free. Now, there's a reason we all do this. It's not just to be sweet. We all hope that people are, are going to see our stuff and go, hmm, I need a little personal attention from Jeff or Sue or Bob or who, whoever the trainer or coach is. But there's lots and lots of free information. Look, I'm an expert at this. I've been doing this 48 years. I've been in sales for a long, long time. I still read most of the books that come out on the, on the subject because I don't know everything. I'm still learning. And sometimes there's new stuff. Things change. I, I've, I've talked about several times to you guys, a book called The Transparency Sale by Todd Capone. Came out, I think, two years ago now. I know Todd. I didn't know how smart he was when I was working with him. But man, he's a brilliant guy. His book was terrific. And he gave me some real insights into the world of sales and the way the brain works that were very useful to me in my, in my selling and in my trainings. I think that you should be studying less. Study hard. Learn the profession of sales. Is there... Is there some basic stuff that I know that you're good at, like being friendly? Les Wolf, I'm talking right to you. You're a friendly guy. You're a very likable guy. Be that, but also take the time. And I'm not talking to you now alone, Les. I'm talking to everybody. Invest in yourself. Every time I go to visit one of my lawyers, they have books on their desk. Every time I see my doctor, which knock on wood is typically once a year. I'm a healthy guy. I go in for my uh, physical. He's always got books on his desk. These are professional guys, and most of them are my age, which means they've been around a while, but they're still studying too. You want to learn how to close? Learn how to sell. Closing is the natural outcome of the sales process done right. When I speak to companies and they say, come teach my people how to close, I always answer the same way. Happy to do it. I'm good at it. What are we going to do with the other seven hours and 55 minutes of the day? Because closing is the natural outcome of doing all the steps that come before asking for people's business correctly. So Les, I hope that answer was useful to you, but study, read some books, go to some seminars, hire a coach or a trainer if you feel you need that personalized attention. Go on YouTube. There's lots and lots of ways. That's how you get to people to invest wisely in your products or services, by knowing how to sell and by making sure you're always focused on the WIFM. The W-I-I-F-M, the what's in it for me, but the what's in it for them. That's what your prospects are listening for, Les. That's what my prospects are listening for. And everybody who else is watching this live or on the replay, by the way, if you're watching this on the replay later on, please do put in a comment saying replay so we know you're here and your name. Uh, but, but that's how you do it, Les. It's a matter of having enough conversations because you're prospecting actively and you're always speaking to new people and you're doing it the right way. You're taking them step by step by step through the process. Here's one thing I see all the time when salespeople fail. They, did, they either didn't have a process that they were aware of. They, everybody has a process, but most of us are not aware of what we're really doing, or their process just isn't working, but they keep on doing it. The way I teach sales, it's not the only way to sell. It's a great way. I make a living teaching people how to do it. And I'm only teaching people what I, what I do myself, but there's lots of ways to sell. There's also lots of wrong ways to sell. And I promise you the best wrong way to sell is, hi, thank you so much for your time. I'm going to get right to the point. Let me tell you why Jeff Goldberg and Associates is the greatest coaching and training firm in the world. I call that throwing up on the customer's shoes. Don't do it. You'll close some business, but you certainly won't close as much as if you take the time to establish rapport, 
ask eight great questions, confirm the answers, make a presentation based on four elements, four elements, enthusiasm, features, benefits, and a verbal proof story, negotiate effectively, and then close. That's how you'll get business less. I hope that was useful. The last question, unless somebody else comes up with one today. Uh, wait, somebody says, hey, Jeff, sorry for being tardy. Do, do you know anything about Clavia.com? Well, obviously, since I didn't know the name, I don't know what that is. Uh, Clavia, Cl Clavia, I'm not sure what that is. Uh, Facebook user, if you would eat, please put in your name and let us know who you are and explain to us what is Clavia.com. Maybe it's something for email marketing. I'm not sure. Uh, by the way, I I'll throw this in for you guys as a bonus. Uh, I was recently introduced to somebody who um, helps companies implement CRM, and he has recommendations about CRM. And uh, I did one of those one-on-one -on -one calls, a get-to-know-you call with him, fascinating guy. And I asked him which CRM he likes the best, and he said Zoho, Z-O-H-O. Um, I was actually stunned because I've used Zoho, and I did not like it. And when he asked me how long ago I used it, I told him it was about six years. And he said that they've made a bunch of changes. Well, I got to tell you something. He showed me what they've done. I think I'm a Zoho fan. In fact, I'm thinking of switching from the one I use, which is called Pipedrive, to Zoho because they now have a whole suite of services that come with their Zoho One product. I think it's about four fifty dollars a year, something like that, uh, which is pretty darn reasonable. Uh, but it comes with a whole suite of services, including marketing automation, stuff like that. Really, really cool stuff. Z Zoho, I apologize for all the times people said, what do you think of Zoho? And I said, not a big fan. I am now a Zoho fan. Um, so the last question, unless somebody else, oh, Barry Heffron. Hey, Barry. So no, I don't know what Clavia or Clavia is. If you'd like to type it in, I'll be sure to share it with everybody. Um, this came from Robin Long. Robin said, how do you keep clients optimistic when a sale is stalled due to circumstances beyond your control? What a great question. Uh, Robin is in real estate. I'm pretty sure I've got the right person. Robin, please correct me if I'm wrong. Actually, I think Robin said she couldn't be here today and she was going to catch the replay, but hopefully you get this answer, Robin. And I'm 99% sure you're in real estate. So I can certainly understand why you would ask a question like this. How do you keep a client optimistic and engaged while a sale is stalled due to circumstances beyond your control? And certainly in real estate, that can happen all kinds of ways. So there are two things that came to mind when I saw your question. The first one is expectations, setting expectations properly. I find, Robin, that quite often salespeople under I'm sorry, over promise and under deliver. I'll get this done in record time. I can deliver this. I can do that. I can do the other thing. Don't worry. I can make this happen. And they're promising the world, knowing they can't do it and hoping that they're going to get over on the prospect and they'll do business anyways. I'm a big fan of the opposite direction. I under promise and over deliver. I will build in extra time for myself. If I think I can do something about, what's today, Friday? By, by next Friday, I'll say it's going to take me about a week and a half. Then when I deliver it to you by next Friday, or even better yet, next Thursday, I look like a hero. Um, in the real estate process, which can be extended, there are many sales that have an extended sales process. But these days with, you know, uh, houses at a premium, uh, you know, people paying way over asking price, people paying cash. I mean, it's insane right now, but there's still a million things that can go wrong. Uh, so set expectations properly about from the very get-go. Look, this we, we may lock out and find you the perfect home on, on your first uh, viewing and the owner might accept your offer right away and everything goes great at the closing and you'll be in your house in 15 days. However, that happens sometimes, but what also happens quite often is things get delayed. We get a bad inspection report. There's a bad title search. There's a million things that could go wrong. And I just want to set your expectations properly. Here's who I'm in the, I am in the matter. I'm going to do everything I possibly can to show you the right homes based on what you tell me you're looking for, to steer you away from anything that I think would be a mistake, to negotiate effectively on your behalf, and to make this happen when you're ready as quickly as I possibly can. But understand some things are going to be out of my or your control, and we're going to have to bite the inside of our cheeks and have patience, knowing that I will do everything I can to make sure you're thrilled beyond belief as quickly as possible. So you're setting people up right from the beginning for who you are in the matter and that this could take a while. The other thing that I think is crucial in this one is having great communication, staying in touch with both your prospects and your clients. The worst thing that you can do, Robin, and the rest of you is 
to not communicate with a prospect and to think, well, I haven't heard from them, so I guess everything's okay. Well, here's one thing I know for sure. If you're not communicating with your prospects, I'm betting that your competition is. Your competition is beating down the doors to speak to your prospects and your clients every single day. My competition's looking to take away my business, just like I'm looking to take away theirs. Now, look, I have a couple of friends right here on Long Island who I respect greatly. I would never consider taking away any of their clients or, or even attempting to. And I've actually had instances where one of my competitors called me and said, hey, you know, I've got this connection. I know this guy is one of your very best clients. I brought on a new partner and he's, he's best friends with this guy. The first thing I said to him was, wow, if the situation was reversed, you would not be getting this call. And of course, do whatever you need to do to go after the client. Business is business. I don't think he would ever purposely do that on a regular basis to me. I certainly wouldn't do it to him or any of my other main competitors who I like and respect. But our competitors, yours and mine, are beaten down the door. So we've got to stay in touch with our prospects, keep them informed, touch them regularly in various ways, call them, email them. Do things to stay in front of them. Send newsletters. Send them information that will be useful. One of my favorite things to do is to know things about my prospects and then send them information that would be helpful. So if, if Robin was a prospect, oh, good morning, Randy Astro. Good to see you here. He says, hey, Jeff. Good to see you, my friend. Oh, where is that thing? Sorry, Randy. I was just going to show everybody the thing that I cannot seem to throw away and I can't find it. I thought I had it on my desk. Randy makes these very cool business cards, which don't look like any other business cards which um, when I first spoke to me, he said, I'm going to send you one of these and you're never going to throw it away. And every time I look at it, it's been on my desk probably for a year. And I go, why do I need this business card? It's not like a regular business card. It's taking up more room. Can't bring myself to throw it up away, to throw it, not to throw it up, to throw it away. Uh, check out Randy Astro online. He's a cool guy. Uh, but uh, communication is key. You've got to stay in touch with your prospects. Do everything you can. So I was saying, I like to look up uh, information on people that when I know stuff about them. So if I was trying to sell Randy something and I knew that he um, he had kids who were in high school and were going off to college soon, I'd be sending him information out some of the best colleges or how to get into a good college or how to write a college essay or how to get uh, scholarships or things like that. Things that I knew would serve him that have nothing to do with him doing business with me, by the way. I don't sell college. I don't sell loans for college or anything, that other stuff, but by asking questions and learning about Randy or any other prospect, maybe he's a golfer, maybe he likes Pink Floyd like I do, uh, maybe he likes pugs like I, there's always commonality if you ask enough questions and have enough conversations, but it's staying in touch with people and letting them know you're thinking about them, keeping them informed every step of the way that, yes, it's taking a little longer than expected, here's what's going on. Here's how I'm handling it. And here's the next time I'm going to reach out to you and let you know what's going on. That's what I think will keep them uh, optimistic when a sale is stalled. At some point, Robin, there's going to be nothing that you can do if it goes on too long. But I believe that if you show people that you're working hard for them, that you're really trying, that people will give you the benefit of the doubt for quite a while. I know when I hire salespeople, um, when I hire salespeople and when I'm an outsourced sales manager, one of the things I do is I hire people for, for the sales team. Um, I'll give people the benefit of the doubt for quite a while, as long as they communicate with me. And I know that they're trying their very best. My feeling about sales management in general is if you're giving it your all and I'm giving it my all, we can probably make it work. Maybe not immediately, but we can make, make you into a success. If I'm giving my all, but you're not giving your all, you're not communicating with me, you're not trying your hardest, I'm going to lose patience very quickly. Or if you are doing your best, but you're just not going to make it, at some point, I got to let you go. But somebody who stays in communication with me, who comes to me with questions, who comes to me with challenges, and who comes to me with problems, who keeps me informed with what's going on, who asks me for my advice, that's somebody I'm going to give a fairly long leash to. Not forever, but fairly long. Same thing with your prospects, Robin. Stay in touch with them regularly. Don't let the other guy who's constantly calling him saying, how long you been with that person? Do you have an exclusive with them? Give me a shot too. They're going to have the chance to get in. So it's a constant communication. And I've talked about this a gazillion times here, and I'm going to say it again. Your come from, I don't know if I can, uh, I can't show you my, my, my gut. Uh, I'm pointing to my belly right now. I'm using both hands to, to point to my belly. Your come from deep inside your gut has got to be, I'm here to serve you. 
You've got to be coming from truly a place of service. Look, we salespeople have a bad reputation. And that's because there are still some who are unethical. Years ago, it was you know kind of common knowledge that salespeople would lie, cheat, and steal, do anything they needed to do in order to close a deal. Well, that reputation affects all of us, but that's not who most of us are. And if it is you, you should find something else to do. But if you are an honest person who truly wants to help others, let them know that. Your come from deep inside you has got to be, I'm here to help you. And if I can't help you, I'm going to let you know, and I'll introduce you to somebody who can. But it's always coming from service, Robin. When people know that you truly care about them, that you're not just an, I'm sorry, that they're not just another commission check, that's when they'll hang out with you for longer than expected. That's when they'll give you the benefit of the doubt. And that's how they'll stay optimistic because they know that Robin's out there doing everything she possibly can to make things happen in the right way for them. And sometimes we've got to tell our prospects, look, this has to happen the right way. I could rush things, but you don't want to get into your house and then find out that you don't really own it because somebody else does. Or you don't want to get to the closing and find out there's an issue. And that, that, that $50,000 check that you brought with you is going back into your bank account today. And you're not going to move into your dream home in Huntington or wherever. I'm not sure where you sell, Robin. So that's what I would do, Robin. I'd be making sure I stay in touch and set expectations properly. We're at the last four minutes and I've run out of questions. Let's see. Randy says, it is there. <laughs> it is here somewhere, Randy. I know I just moved it the other day. I wish I could show it to you guys because it's really super cool. Um, if there are no other questions, then I'm going to end. I'm going to excuse you guys so you can go home uh, you, or you get to class four minutes early. Uh, as always, if there's anything I can do to help any of you, first of all, know this: I really appreciate you being a part of the Sales Pro Network. We've grown this in just over a year to about 850 members. Uh, in my head, it was going to be much larger by now. I was hoping for 10,000 by now, but we're working our way up slowly. If you know anybody who should be a member, please feel free to invite them. I'm the only administrator right now. So when I see that you've recommended somebody, I'm certainly going to let them in. If there's anything I can do for any of you personally, please feel free to reach out to me. If you don't have my email, it's jeff at jgsalespro.com, J-E-F-F at J-G-S-A-L-E-S-P-R-O.com. You can always call me at 516-608-4136. And I'm always happy to help. Don't get me wrong. I, I do this for a living. If you're calling me every day for four hours a day, at some point, I'm going to say, hey, uh, you know, I think we have to talk about you engaging my services, but I'm always happy to help you guys. And I'm really glad that you're members here. So I'll end as I always do. First of all, have a great weekend. I think it's supposed to be very nice here in the Northeast. I hope wherever you are, it's going to be nice weather too. And please remember this. Sales is a game of making things happen. So make sure that you get out there and make sales happen. Thank you, everybody. Have a great one.